All right. Um, the purpose of this short video lecture is to add some explanation to the handout um, Markov process. <coughs> the Markov process we discuss in this section in chapter 6 is a very simple case. It's not the most general Markov process. So we just focus on this model then later on we can use this model to discuss other application problems. Okay. In fact, this Markov process is a direct generalization of another process we already know, the, the Poisson process. So just we first review the Poisson process. We recall that for the Poisson process we have this diagram Um, we have, this is the time t axis, and Poisson process, we use nt. t is continuous, and that's why we call this a process instead of a chain. Now when t is zero, we say that's the starting point, okay. <clears throat> and then we have these arrival times, t1 and t2, and possibly t3 over here, and t4 like this. So these are the arrival times in the Poisson process. In the simplest case, when you have an arrival time, then the value of nt goes up by 1. So at t1, you have a jump. And then until you get to t2. And then you have another jump to t3. And then you have another jump. So that's the Poisson process we talked about in the past, okay. Poisson process. <coughs> now what's going to be a Markov process in our context? Look at what's ha what happened at each arrival time. The value of nt jumps by 1. Now we're going to replace this jump by a Markov chain. So instead of numbers for nt, we are going to have states. So now this is a Markov process. <coughs> Markov process. The diagram is exactly the same. So we're going to just draw the diagram. But this time, this vertical axis is the states instead of the numbers. <coughs> and we here still have time, t. <coughs> so y of t, now for each t, is a discrete random variable. And t is again between 0 and infinity. Now when t is equal to 0, y of 0 may not be zero anymore because we are looking at states. States can be non-numbers. So we can say, well, initially there is a state i over here. So this is state i. Okay. And that's when t is equal to zero. So you can say y of t zero, y not is equal to i. And then you still have these arrival times, but now we don't call them arrival times. Instead, we call them jump times. We have these, now we call them jump times. Completely analogous to the arrival times. So now what's going to happen when you reach T1? 
there will be a jump from state i to some state j, but you don't know which state j is. That's the part we will use Markov chain to explain. So here, um, between t0 and t1, you have state i. And then there's a jump. So maybe it's going to be actually over here. This is going to be another state. Let me call it j1 over here. So now at t1, you have j1 now. And then keep going until another jump time. Now, you can further jump up. You don't know because these are just states. But for convenience, we can say it's going to jump down now and then keep going like this for some time. So this is another possible state for the Markov process. And then you can imagine what's going to happen. At T3, there's another jump, maybe even lower. But we are not talking about values, just different states. So T4 may be somewhere over here. And keep going like this. So for each T, you're going to have one of these states. We are going to assume the state space E over here is discrete. So either finite or countably many. So you can say, OK, these are the states. You have I1, I2, etc. These are states. You can use integers. Then our graph makes perfect sense. So just try to remember the Markov process we have here follows this type of visualization. <laughs> now, we haven't mentioned why this process is called Markov yet, but clearly we need to have Markov property. So you will see Markov property means that your future probabilities are completely determined by the state at the current time. In terms of Mathematics, we say the probability that at a future time, t plus s is equal to j. Suppose you know all the states up to time t. So given all the states up to time t. This is something we know. And this probability is equal to the probability of y t plus s is equal to j and given exactly at the present time. So you only need to know the present time state, and then you know the probability of the future. This is Markov property. <coughs> and another one important is that we only study stationary Markov process. So stationary means that a shift in the time does not change this probability. So what we have over here is that the probability y t plus s is equal to j, given that y t, let's say, is equal to i. This probability is exactly the same as this probability y sub s is equal to j, and y zero is equal to i. You can see this is translation invariant. So that's the definition part. Now, after the definition part, we want to see how we can characterize this Markov process, or what kind of things we need to know about the process so we can actually do some calculation, interesting calculation. Compare with, again, the Poisson process. <coughs> what we have now we have these jump times. In the Poisson process, we assume that the time intervals over here, they are independent random variables, and they follow the exponential distribution. That's the same thing we're going to assume. So here, if you look at the difference between two consecutive jump times, this Tn plus 1 minus Tn, this time, we have a new name. This is called sojourn time. Really, you can say just the waiting time, waiting for the next jump. Right? 
right? This is just waiting time. That's the meaning of sojourn time. And we assume all these random variables n start from 0 and 1 and 2. They are, first of all, these are continuous random variables. They are continuous random variables. And we assume they have the same exponential distribution with just a little bit difference in the rate. So they are exponential distribution and independent. So that's the thing we also had in Poisson process. Exponential distribution means the probability that Tn minus T, Tn plus 1 minus Tn less than or equal to T, this one over here, given that Y at Tn is equal to I. We want to make this probability a little bit more general, so it's dependent on the previous state and this is 1 minus e to the negative lambda i over here and t. Okay. <clears throat> you can see over here the meaning. If t is big, then e to the negative lambda i t is small, and this value is close to 1. That means the, the random variable is about to change its value. The jump is about to occur. So this is 1. For Markov process, we want to make this assumption. And another assumption is about where this state is going to change to. So if we look at, at the jumping point over here, start from i, we ask what's going to be the state at the jump time. Now that's going to be one of the state. So we are going to look at the following Markov chain. And this is called the embedded Markov chain. So we look at, this is called the embedded Markov chain. We look at the values at these jumping times. We call it xn, which is simply y at tn. And this is going to be a Markov chain. This is going to be, because now it's discrete time. This is going to be a Markov chain. And this Markov chain will tell us which state is likely happen if a jump happens. So we are going to look at it's a Markov matrix. Because it's a Markov chain, so we have a Markov matrix. And that's going to be P, I, J. That's the probability that x n plus y is equal to j if you know x n is equal to i. Now combine these two, the exponential distribution of the sojourn time and also the Markov matrix for the probability jumping from one state to the next together completely describe the Markov process we actually are studying. Once we know these two things, then we know how to calculate the probabilities for certain interesting objects we want to study. <clears throat>